which we've read already today, because we are children of God, and as a result, because we are children of God, God supernatural love, you see, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, not the world's love, folks, but God's love, and um, it's shed abroad in our hearts. We already have it in Christ, we're complete in Him. And as a result, God expects His children to exercise that love sparsely towards Him. He has to have the preeminence. And then also, many times in the scriptures, it's throughout love the brethren. Jesus said, John said, many others said, to love God first, love the brethren, and then have a love, of course, for the lost. In verse 2 of our passage we've read today, it says, and walk in love. And walk in love. In this passage today, Paul presents some positive truths about genuine, true, godly love. And then the contrast of the negative truths about Satan's counterfeit love and its consequences. There's a massive difference between God's love and the world's love. And Paul exhorts these believers at Ephesus in verse 2 on walk in love. God exhorts his people today to walk in love. God exhorts his people to love him primarily but also love the brethren as well as have a love for the lost. God does not want his people to be cold-hearted. He wants his people to be tender-hearted. From the beginning of this passage we've read here today, first of all in verse 1 and 2, there's the plea here, the plea, verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love. This is Paul's plea. This is Paul's exhortation to these believers at Ephesus. In verse 1, Paul is instructing these Ephesians by, by being imitators of the living God. By expressing his sacrificial love as God's love is action, not just word, it is deed. This is why we were saying earlier and referring to the Wesley sin being changed from glory to glory. Be imitators of God. Be imitators of Christ. That is our goal. Be you perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is the highest requirement of all. No one will be perfect until we get the glory. But nevertheless, it should be our desire, it should be our goal to be more Christ-like. Imitators of God. The world has many imitators of their idols. But God, Paul exhorts us to be imitators, followers of God. Every redeemed, true redeemed child of God who carries God's name are supposed to be imitators of God's character. The challenge is this morning, folks, is the fruit of the Spirit evident at least to some degree in our daily lives. This is a good test. To show if someone is truly saved with the grace of God. Is the fruit of the Spirit evident to at least some degree in our daily lives? First of all, the first one is love, in which the other eight graces, there's nine included, but the other eight I am love. Is God's love being expressed in our lives? Or are we being contentious? Or are we being awkward? Or are we there for one another? Love, joy, are we rejoicing in our salvation? People should see the difference. That person saved, they should see the difference. Because, folks, they have a joy within us. God's supernatural joy in our hearts. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Have joy in the Holy Ghost, the Scriptures command us. Are we a joyful people? Love, joy, peace. Jesus says, I give you a peace. The Lord doesn't understand this peace. You see, the believer has peace with God and justification. But have we the peace of God as we're walking in the light, praying glory to his name? Or are we struggling in our walk? The peace of God, we're not experiencing it in that context. Long suffering. In life's journey, we've all experienced.
face, there's some people you get on very well with, and then there's other people who irritate you. But yet the Bible tells us to be long suffering, patient in other words, gentleness. The Lord does not want his people to be hard hearted or rash. He wants us to be gentle and tender hearted one with another. Goodness, doing good deeds, of course. Of course, we're created in Christ Jesus. On the good deeds, on the good works. Good works doesn't save us, but it's a manifestation of, to show that we are saved. Faith, faithfulness, the just shall live by faith. It's a continuous action, continuing on by faith. God's children through children by his grace and power, continuing on by faith, faithfulness, meekness, humility. Are we humble? God delights in mercy on his people walking humbly before him. And also, of course, temperance, self-control, or to be off on explosions of rage. When it doesn't go our way, that is total carnality, that is immaturity, folks. Some challenge. God expects his people, you see, to love one another. As God's people walk in love, we should express a forgiving attitude, not holding bitterness towards anyone because the infinite depths of God's love has been displayed on how much he has forgiven us. So in return, our depth of love should be shown by how much we forgive. By expressing the qualities of God's love, verse 32 of chapter 4, and be you kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, I've forgiven you. The Apostle Jude, Jude reminds us, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And folks, how do we keep ourselves in the love of God? Surely if you love someone, you want to be in their presence. It's a delight if you love someone. It's a delight to be in their presence. How do we keep ourselves in the love of God? It's, it's, it's a disciplined walk. It's a commitment. It's being devoted to Jesus Christ. It's studying His Word. It's applying His Word. It's, it's keeping His Word. It's the place of prayer. It's serving Him. It's everything you want to do is for the glory of God that please Him. Keep yourselves in the love of God, it says. It's a disciplined life. When we are not hard-hearted, when we are tender-hearted, unsensitive, not grieving or cranching the Spirit, but sensitive to the Holy Ghost on His Word, by walking, being filled by the Spirit, not grieving the Spirit, then God's love will be expressed and be manifested. The new nature, God's love within, you see, builds bridges. It doesn't destroy, it builds, it edifies, it strengthens. The new nature, God's love, but then builds bridges and proclaims peace. It is not contentious, as it is loving, it is sacrificial, thinking of others, thinking of God only. Asking ourselves, if I'm going to do this action, am I bringing glory to God here? But if we give place to the flesh, you see, it is selfish, it is unloving. It is self-centeredness, it is pride, by building walls on the clear's war. See the contrast, God's love within the believer and the new nature. It builds bridges, it proclaims peace, it edifies, it encourages, it blesses. But if we give place to the flesh, it is self-centeredness, it is pride, it is selfishness, it is unloving by building walls on the clear's war. Which is after the devil. God is truly glorified when his people are expressing his love by keeping his commandments, of course. Walk in love, Paul says. Jesus says, if you love me, me keep my commandments. God's commandments are not grievous. His word is pure. His word is profitable. His word encourages us. His word strengthens us. His word sanctifies us. His word instructs us. His word gives us wisdom. His word is always far best and far benefit. The only become grievous the word of God is when we are being disobedient to the living God and then there's a real battle between the 
the flesh and the spirit, when you're struggling in your walk, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If our relationship is right with God, it will be right with others, generally speaking. It is always good to reflect what the Lord, you see, in his infinite love has done for us. As Paul gives us a pattern by bringing us back to the cross in verse 2. He says, And walk in love as Christ also have loved us, and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Saviour. God has demonstrated already his love towards us through his Son, that ultimate sacrifice. He's shown us a pattern of true love by bringing us back to the cross as Christ gave himself. He became that substitutionally atoning sacrifice for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. There was no greater display of love, there was no greater cost or display of love at Calvary as it passes knowledge. This is the supreme, matchless love as Jesus the innocent, Jesus the rich, Christ, folks, owns the whole universe. He owns the money, the, the gold and the silver. And yet, he became poor. And by his poverty, he would make us rich in Christ. The innocent for the guilty, the just for the unjust, the, the perfect for the imperfect, the sinless, glorious Lamb of God paid the penalty for our sin, took our hell, took our shame, took our punishment, took our wrath we deserve and gave us peace with the living God by his ultimate atoning substitutionary sacrifice to save his people from their sins. What a transaction took place. What love. If you're going through a trial this morning or this afternoon, you're struggling folks, go back to the cross. Christ, I mentioned it here, Christ owns the universe. Christ is the, the rich, most richest person in this universe. He owns the silver and gold. And yet he became poor and through his poverty that we would be rich. Now think about it logically. He called someone's house a very wealthy person today. And asked them to exchange their riches for your poverty, a working class person. What would they do? They'd phone the police to tell you to clear off. Totally looking down on you. So go back to the cross, and if Christ has paid that price for your sin, folks, he's given, given himself his all. Do you think he'll not care for you and sustain you and help you through a trial? He's been touched, you see, with the pain of our infirmities. He's went before us. What a cost. What grace. What love. It's matchless. It's past his knowledge. We must keep Calvary, you see, before us. This is what Paul is saying. He have the pattern here of love, the example in verse 2, and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for our sweet smelling savior. We must keep Calvary before us and remind ourselves what a pattern of inexhaustible, incomprehensible love has been displayed by our glorious, wonderful, all conquering, all sufficient, all powerful, blessed, glorious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Blessed be his name. Jesus says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We can never return or pay the debt of God's matchless love in his Son to redeem us, his people, from our sins. As Christ has expressed his love before us, so now God expects us, his church, his people, to express his love in us towards him and others. We have the provision, dear friends, this afternoon in Jesus Christ. We've preached from it, from this book. We've all spurts of lessons. We're not waiting on any more mystical experiences. We've been baptized by the Spirit into Christ. We're complete in Him with all things pertaining unto life and godliness. Do you see your position, your stand, and your union? Are you extracting, are you exercising your spurts of blessings? They're already there. There's no excuse, you see, with provision of Christ. There's no excuse as we are commanded throughout the Scriptures to love the Lord and others, especially the brethren. In verse 2, and walk in love as Christ also have loved us and have given 
himself quarrels to an offering on sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savior. Savior. So we have discovered the positives here of God's love. It is sacrificial. God gave the Son. God, folks, is continuing to bless us day by day. God's almost given. We are meant to be an Im imitator, a good ambassador, a channel of blessing for God by walking in love. The quick way to move on, we now turn to the negatives as Satan is a great counterfeiter. As God establishes through love, sacrificial, selfless love, Satan normally but uses counterfeit, selfish love, a perversion of true love, a perversion of true love, verse 3 and 4. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you, as become a saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. A perversion of true love. God's love is sacrificial, it's selfless. The world's love inspired by the enemy is all selfishness. In contrast to the pattern of God's love, which is unselfish, forgiving, godly, the world's mindset of love is normally lustful, self-indulgent, selfish, over sensual, constantly seeking after pleasure. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with pleasure. God created pleasure. But the problem is, is especially in this generation, is that it's the indulgence of pleasure which makes things sinful. Coveting, which we're going to look at in a minute. The Lord's love is normally selfish. Look after number one, is their, their statement. And is selfish by fulfilling one's needs and desires by meeting their own expectations, no matter who they will hurt in the process. The Lord promotes its so called love through the avenue of songs, <coughs> novels, movies, dramas. Etc., etc., by continually to target the emotional, lustful desires of the flesh in this entertainment age, especially we live in. In a sense, it is easy prey for the unsaved to captivate them. Because a lot of things today, folks, is all geared to the sensual, it's targeting the flesh. And sinners in their own strength are completely and utterly captivated, paralyzed by the no power you see they haven't got in them. The no power to get victory. Then we have the false teachers, of course, under the ecumenical movement, Satan's puppets promote, promoting their false doctrines of so-called love, misrepresenting the biblical word of love, of course, such deception. Yet, if you truly love someone, you will tell them the whole truth. Preach the true gospel on the whole counsel of God. So it is to no surprise because of the world's misguided misconception of true love, which in many times is feeding the flesh, the lust, the world's love then, this kind of love leads automatically to fornication and all uncleanness in verse 3a. But fornication and all uncleanness, it says, Immorality, in other words, impurity, which is selfish and destructive, it is a deceptive counterfeit of God's love. Immorality, fornication, and uncleanness, impurity is selfish and destructive, a deceptive counterfeit of God's love. Fornication, we're going to look at this here for a minute. What does Paul mean by fornication here in verse 3a? Yeah. Fornication is a lustful passion, refusing to discipline his or her sexual desire. It is an uncontrolled, strong, lustful appetite in which a person gives into. Fornication refers to all sexual sin outside the moral union. 
But of course, people in marriage can also fall into the trap of fornication. You see, folks, fornication covers all sexual sin. It's the word pornea. It covers all sexual sin. Adultery. Pornography, which we'll look at in a minute, which say is one of the biggest scourges to society. Prostitution, sodomy, etc., etc., the list can go on. Years ago, it was frowned upon a great embarrassment and shame for two people to move in together before marriage, which leads to fornication, and at times children then can be born out of wedlock. It's a norm today, folks. It's a normal thing to do in the war's eyes in this generation, but folks, it is sin. And God takes fornication very seriously, as well as all sin. But we know the Lord is a merciful God, and the Lord has had mercy on us. So I'm not just pointing the finger at any, any of at us, and pointing the finger at me as well as, as well as us. God is a merciful God. But nevertheless, folks, it is sin, and God takes it very serious. And the Lord reported in iniquity again, anyone, no one can stand. It's only through the Lord's mercies. That we're not all concerned. But nevertheless, we have to be faithful to God's word. Romans 20, or Numbers 25 says, God wiped out 24,000 Jews for committing fornication with the Moabites. It says here in Israel abode in Shedem, and the people began to commit Urdom for the daughters of Moab, and those that died in the plague were 24,000. We're in a generation, folks, that people turn a blind eye to sin. Sin is sin. It is serious business with the living God. And if you're holding on to your sin, you will, and if you die in your sin, you see the punishment of death. It will be eternal death, eternal separation in the lake of fire for eternity. Sin requires death. Praise God, Jesus Christ died to see the sea of sinners. That is a requirement of sin. It is death. But Christ has paid the price. Are you in Christ? Is your sins gone? Have you a judicial standing for Almighty God? A right standing? Peace with God? Sins gone? Purged by the precious blood of Christ? Are you still holding on to your sin? You see, sin requires death. And if you die in your sin, folks, you will experience eternal death, eternal wrath under God's judgment in the lake of fire for eternity. Paul makes it clear, people who practice sexual sins, which we're going to continue on here, they will not enter the kingdom of God, no matter what they profess. This generation has no shame, as it is a sex crazed, immoral, decadent, pleasure-seeking society. The sex industry is worth billions upon billions. And a lot of things, of course, is used through the avenue of the internet. Again, it's not the internet that's the problem. We can use it. We can use it uh, for God's glory. But folks, most of the time, the internet is being used for Satan's glory, which, of course, is used as a tool to allure, activate the sensual part of us, the fleshly part. If the Lord Jesus gives solemn warnings, wherefore if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee, it is better for thee to enter into life, halt or maim, rather than with having two hands or two feet, to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, it is better for thee to enter into life with an eye, rather than having two eyes and cast into the fire. Mortified. Folks, many are hooked in pornography. I do not get any pleasure in speaking about these horrible sins, but a many are hooked on it. The masses, the masses are hooked on it. Christ says, if you continue on it, no matter what you profess, you will not enter his kingdom, you will enter everlasting fire. You see, God's people, folks, generally do not practice sin. They don't continue on in sin. 
Any person who gives an advocate for sin, a sin of religion, folks, they're a false teacher. God's people do not practice or continue on in sin. There's times we can sin. And when we do, we know we, we ask the Lord to forgive us for them. But we do not practice. It's not a way of life. It's not our lifestyle. God's people are separate. We are lifestyle is holiness. We do not practice or continue on in sin. We hate it. We mortify it. We love righteousness and hate iniquity. It is a true sign of a true believer in Jesus Christ. The world, you see, love their sin. The love to satisfy and gratify the flesh as they continue on in it, which will lead to God's judgment and hell, the judgment of disobedience. No true child of God should be in bondage, folks, to sin, as Christ is his master. Christ has come to forgive our sins, to put away our sin, to set us free from the power and dominion of sin. There shall, the scripture tell us, sin does not have dominion over us. Sin is not our master. Christ is our master. Sin is the master to the world. It is not the master to the child of God. And folks, here is a clear indication again of test. The Bible is throughout test referring to showing who is a true believer from a false believer, a false professor. The Apostle John gives us a clear test, a true believer from the false. Whosoever is born of God, in other words, saved, born again, God's spirit dwells within. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit, practice sin. Clear test. They do not continue on in sin. He, the contrast is, he that committeth, practices sin, is off the devil. It is clear. It is not complicated. We, you know, people are without an excuse. God's word, you see, is transformed. God is a God of revelation. God does not deceive anyone. Satan deceives. And deceives many who profess who are never truly in, thinking they can hold on to their sin, what suits them, and they think that they have a ticket for heaven. It is a delusion, and that they're being duped. It is a deception. Whosoever is born of God does not commit practice sin. So Paul tells us here, fornication and all uncleanness, let it not once name among you of the common sense. So loss of sexual self-control then normally leads to uncleanness and purity in verse 3 But fornication and all uncleanness, he says. Loss of sexual self-control, fornication in other words, then normally leads to uncleanness and purity. Uncleanness and purity is in the Greek akath rasia, in the Greek which refers to anything that is unclean and filthy. Jesus used the word to describe the rottenness of the decaying bodies in the tomb, Matthew 23, but it is used another ten times in the New Testament being associated with sexual sin. It can refer to all types of sexual corruption to gratify the flesh such as polluted ideas, fantasies, passions, and even immoral thoughts. Then the Lord said, if you look upon a woman, dwell on it, meditate upon it, which leads to these impure thoughts, you've already committed adultery in your heart. In this polluted, corrupt society, people's minds are in the gutter. It costs what they're watching through the internet and so forth. And they're completely conformed to this type of thinking because what they're putting in front of them, their minds are in the gutter of sex madness is a contemporary lifestyle for many with no parameters, no boundaries in their perverted thinking. This is the society folks we're in right now. The more fiber has basically vanished from society. But also in this group we have covetousness, which we've all done if we're honest. This was the sin which struck Saul of Tarsus. He thought he had kept all the Ten Commandments until thou shalt not covet. And we realize he was guilty before holy God. Romans 7 explains that. Covetousness, this leads in. 
on the covetousness which is linked in a sense to fornication and cleanness as it is an expression you see covetousness folks is an expression of self-will self-determination self-gratification and self-centeredness which leads to lustful uncontrollable self-indulgence known as greed verse 3a the fornication and all uncleanness are covetousness what did jesus say remember that when he mentioned about the man and the pulled down the horns thinking that he was going to live the rest of his days and, and great the pleasures of this earth and lord thy food thy soul is required of thee tonight take heed and beware of covetousness I wonder how many sermons is preached on covetousness in the church and Ulster today. And I speak first for my own words, folks, that I've fallen through. But the Lord's merciful. The Lord picks his people up again, but we're, what we learn from him. Covetousness is contrary to love, which you see is self giving, but desires strongly lusts after something for their own selfish purposes. And at times will go to any lengths to get it, no matter who it hurts. You see, folks, covetousness, we've looked at this years ago, the sermon on Ahab, Jezebel, and Naboth. Naboth. What happened? It was covetousness first, and it led to telling lies, stealing, and then murder. Covetousness is really great. It is self-indulgence. And it will go to any length to get what it wants, no matter who it hurts. And at times people will tell lies to get what they want. A man here in serious death because of covetousness. No contentment. And in many cases, they don't even really need it. I've heard a priest that I've said it many times. There is nothing wrong with doing something if it doesn't own you. All good gifts come from above. There's nothing wrong with God's blessings of things. But there's a fine line, folks, between blasted stuff and being powerless. The Bible reminds us godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. How many who profess salvation and they're building up and they're building up and they're building up in this world and they're losing out in the, the great eternity. They're going to be standing if they're saved empty handed, talk about embarrassment and the judgment seat of Christ. How many professing Christians are in bondage with covetousness? The reason being they are not content you see in the Lord. They're not content in their walk with the Lord. As they're always chasing after something to fulfill their lustful desire, spending countless hours and hours and hours and hours chasing it through internet, through whatever else. Sexual sins, you see, as well as lustful covetousness, can be powerful on a can. And if given liberty, given look, given free reign, they can become very destructive. And sensitive to the feelings and welfare of others. You see, folks, covetousness is just pure selfishness. Covetousness, as well as sex of sins, can destroy marriages, destroy relationships, as well as an individual. How many are in bondage to these destructive sins, even amongst professing Christians? As believers, folks, we need to be on our guard to deny ourselves. What did Jesus say? If any man or woman come up to me, let them deny themselves. That's not just salvation. That's the whole kind through salvation and, and sanctification. Take up your cross daily. As believers, we need to be on our guard to deny ourselves, mortify, cut off, yield to the spirit and not to the flesh. Paul gives us a solemn warning here. It's verse 3b. But fornication and cleanness, covetousness, let it not be once named among you, as becometh 
saints. It is monstrous and false thinking. That a believer continues on in these. It says not that it be once named among you. It is inconceivable for a believer to practice these. But the apostle does not stop there regarding this perversion of the so-called love. But also manifests itself through the avenue of the tongue, which really describes the condition of the heart. Verse 4. For I quickly neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Under no uncertain terms should these sins be a pattern or even related to the speech of a true Christian. What is filthiness here? In verse 4, neither filthiness. Filthiness, folks, is something shameful or obscene. A Christian should not be telling dirty jokes or things that make people blush. Yet our generation is plagued with shameful language in the gutter. Filthiness from men and women. Foolish talking. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking. Foolish talking is silly talk. Talking just for the sake of it, looking to be heard. It is flippant talk, clowning around as turning everything into a joke when at times, yes, of course there's not wrong with having a bit of fun, of course, but at times, folks, there's, there's a time to laugh, there's a time to be serious, there's a time to be solemn. Turning everything light-hearted into a joke, extending the sounds which can become double meanings. What about jesting? It says here, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting. Jesting is to make cutting remarks, hurtful words against someone, thinking that in their pride they are better, clever than that person by feeding their ego, by trying to impress. But Paul says in contrast here, but rather giving of thanks in verse 4b. Paul reminds the Colossians, let your speech be always with grace. That is some challenge for all of us. Let your speech be always with grace. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Are we giving thanks to the Lord for his goodness, for whom he is, for saving us, for all the blessings he pours upon us? Are we a complaining people just looking inward, poor me, self pity people? You see, folks, what is the will of God that tells us and everything give thanks? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God expects his people to be a grateful people, a joyful people, a rejoicing people. But finally, as I conclude here, we discover the punishment then for these people who practice these sins. The seer's consequences in relation to Satan's counterfeit love. Verse 5 to 7. I'm almost finished here. Verse 5. For this she know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you and with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore protectors with them. People who practice these sins are labelled as children of disobedience who are under God's wrath and will not enter the kingdom of heaven. They're no diving towards God's will eternally, a collision course with Almighty God. Verse 5 For this you know that no good monger nor unclean person or thoughtless man who is thy daughter have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Don't let the preachers, the false teachers, deceive you with vain words. Go to the Lord, folks. Go to this book. This is the final authority. Read it. Study it. There's so much deception out there. Paul exhorts us not to be deceived by their vain words or lying, and also their, who advocate these practices. Have discernment. Separate ourselves from them and their practices. As they have practiced their ungodly sins. Verse 6a. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Verse 7. Be not ye therefore protectors with them. Separation. What's fellowship? Has light with darkness. 
Can two walk together except they be agreed? A true believer will prove the reality of saving faith by a consistent, obedient life as he loves the Lord and his commandments, as he walks in the light, as he walks in love, as he walks in newness of life, as he walks in humility, as he walks in the spirit, as he walks worthy of the vocation he has called us to. This was the very beginning of, of these exhortations in chapter 4, verse 1. That you, I beseech you, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. As the false professing believer walks in his or her selfish terms, what suits their agenda and lustful desires. The Bible doesn't leave us in the dark, folks. The Bible gives us clear tests to show who is the true believer from the false. Paul reminds us at the very end of Corinthians, the second book, because of the nonsense which was going on, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith or not. Do not be deceived by anyone or your own heart. Folks, make your calling an election sure. And praise God, it's God's people who are saved, but we do know we are saved and we're going to the right. Because it manifests itself in our walk with God. And the Lord bless this very serious portion of scripture to us. This morning we'll just conclude our meeting by singing the number 396. Jesus, keep me near the cross. You see, the cross is the greatest expression of love. Verse 2, of course, of our apostle today. There, a precious fountain. It's always good to go back to Calvary. Free to all, a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever. Till my rapture, so shall find rest beyond the river. The psalm, please, and the sinners, let them know the end of the hour as they declare me. Thank you.